Often what we don't examine in the context of, of global change is where are the resilient places uh, that might uh, persist or, or uh, evolve, if you will, over, over space and time. And one of the things that I struggle with as a scientist is I feel like all the media and everything we hear around us influences the type of research we do because the sky is always falling. And I would love someone to ask these questions of where is the sky not falling? And there's a group of researchers out in the West, we go to these meetings, smaller meetings, and we're starting to ask these questions, where is the resiliency in the landscape? Why is the sky not falling in these locations? What does it mean for evolution of trajectories of society? Those types of, let's not call them just optimistic, but sort of realistic scenarios. Where can you go grapes in the future? Mm -hmm. Those stories would be critical to incorporate in the future. Where are there resilient landscapes? Why do certain plants not shift in the landscape when there's climate change? For me, I want to study these lakes. Why are some lakes, like small lakes, why aren't they changing? Mm -hmm. Even though the temperature's warm a degree. Mm -hmm. Brilliant questions to ask for humanity. Just, just describe for me some sense of the stories that are hidden right here, right around us, social and ecological. Sure, so behind me is this beautiful backdrop of Lake Tahoe that is this ever-changing large deep lake that's been influenced by changes early on with development of the watershed that might impact clarity. But now with forces of climate and invasions of species that might alter the ecological dynamic, not just clarity in this case, but biodiversity. So our group and the scientists out here try to understand those changes, but now in the context of economic and social changes. So for example, uh, the Lake Tahoe system is dependent on snowpack, and yet you see businesses here that are quite resilient. They're sort of shifting their business dynamic to change from snow mediated uh, tourism to maybe in the winter doing more ecological out outdoor family friendly activities. So how does that impact the lake or how can it uh, influence things here? And what was that stat you said about how many ski areas there are? Yeah, so in Lake Tahoe there's uh, more ski areas per unit area than any other place in North America. So a real opportunity for winter sports. But now with shifting trajectories of global change, climate for example, uh, variable snow packs, there's a, a need here to, to look at the economics in a very different way. What can the communities here do from a regional standpoint and a local standpoint to uh, develop uh, their economics, but take advantage of climate uncertainties, for example. And, and, and in terms of lakes, what, what is it about lake study that isn't happening that is poised to happen or could happen? Or yeah, the night the needs to happen. The incredible thing about lakes is they're basically integrators of not only just national, international kind of change concepts, but local, local change. And so on the west coast of the United States, we have a number of lakes in the mountains that are really sensitive to changes. Two of the large ones, Lake Tahoe right behind me and Crater Lake, for example, up in Oregon, they're managed in very different ways. Crater Lake in Oregon is this large deep lake that's uh, wholly federally managed as an from the National Park Service. Lake Tahoe is multi-jurisdictional, private and public and state entities. For me as a lake ecologist, it's pretty exciting to think about those different management, social scenarios of management, uh, because in some cases, for example, at Crater Lake in Oregon, all the federal management might go into saving a clear lake, but there's these externalities that continue to cause it to change. And that's things like climate. Mm -hmm. And one last thing, um, there's talk here of a national water plan. Can you describe what the potential is there and why that would be a cool story. Yeah, so one of the major things we're trying to get out in the West here is trying to understand water supply and water delivery in the greater Western landscape, Western states, states that are influenced by their climate, by groundwater influences. Um, and in this particular case, we're trying to start understanding how do you manage water in the West in the context of greater national need for water. And so there's some conversations amongst our group about do we need a national water plan? What would that national water plan look like? Does it have to be politically driven by states, state entities, or do they should we cross across borders with watersheds, uh, which you know cross state lines? And so a national water plan is something we don't have in this country, and it's something that might allow us to pull together to solve yeah. some of the emerging crises that are occurring. And I mentioned to you this notion I've heard from several scientists who are working on the notion. Well, they're in the southeast, and they say, well, a great part of any kind of national water plan would be to move agriculture to where the water is and out of California, and you, sound, you sounded pretty pumped about that in some ways. Well, so in, in an ever-changing global philosophy of living, 
we need to rethink how we manage water and how we grow things and how we live in a sustainable or semi-sustainable way. Moving agricultural crops and commodities from production from California to the southeast could be very appealing for, for a national goal. At the same time, we might also might consider why not move that water from the east to California? These are real world trade-offs that people face. But thinking, face. but thinking on that scale is something that... Yeah, think big!